All right, shall I proceed? You shall, yeah. <laughs> I shall proceed. Hi, everyone. I'm glad to be joining you today. I apologize, I, I missed the first few presentations, but happy to be here now. I, um, I'm going to take about 20 minutes to talk about electric vehicle charge management and strategic charger placement. And then, um, like usual, we'll have some time at the end for, for questions. All right, next slide, please. So, so first, I, I want to talk a little bit about what we know about how people use charging stations or charging equipment. Um, in from 2010 to 2015, there were a number of studies, and INL was was uh, fortunate to be part of um, some of those studies to collect data to analyze how how people how early adopters of EVs were driving and charging their their cars, and we we found that. Um, Drivers of both PHEVs like the Chevy Volt, with a you know with both uh, electric powertrain and and gas range extending engines, um, as well as Nissan Leaf drivers with you know pure battery electric vehicles, spent most of did perform most of their charging at home and or work, and very little small amount of that charging was done in public, and that became known as a uh, the charging pyramid, as you see on the right, that is not, it's kind of become conventional wisdom. So next slide, please. So, next, so fast forward a few years in 2019, the Department of Energy's Vehicle Technologies Office funded a company called Energetics to, to collect data on, uh, or collect a new set of data on, from electric vehicles. Rather than working with automakers, Energetics decided to uh, recruit independently recruit EV owners to participate in a study and work with the data logger provider to have data loggers installed in those vehicles. And this study is important because things have changed, right? We want to see how, how um, EV owner charging behavior may have changed as because there are more makes and models available, um, presumably a, a greater diversity of, of people buying those cars. And of course, longer EV range, higher charging power, as Matt was just talking about, and more charging infrastructure in the public and in several areas of the country. And so this, this project is ongoing. INL has an advisory role in this project. So we don't necessarily have a, a ton of skin in the game, but we certainly are benefiting from and trying to see that this, this project is successful. Um, so I wanted to bring it up to all of you as an opportunity for you to first learn what's being what is, um, you know, what the findings will be from the project, but also if you want to participate, the Energetics is still looking for, for uh, EV owners to participate in the project. I just signed up. Uh, I figured after so many years of looking at other people's EV data, I should start contributing my own. So I have, I received a, uh, a small cartridge style data logger and plugged it in myself to my, to my car. And there's a website that, a portal that I can go to to, to see the data that's being collected. And so if any of you are interested in, in offering your, your vehicle for to science, as it were, um, feel free to check out ewatts.org or email uh, the Ener energetics at the email you see here. The goal is for them to collect data from 2,600 vehicles in total. Some of those will be fleet vehicles, some will be privately owned. And then they are, at the same time are also collecting data from, from or I should say, receiving data from ChargePoint to understand charging, the use of uh, electric vehicle supply equipment in, in the public across the country. So, so that's today. Next slide, please. What about the future? Based on what, what we have learned from the past and what we see going on now, um, the, it, I, I want to change the or reframe the discussion a little bit about about charging and the charging pyramid. The the Biden administration has set some aggressive targets for EV adoption. The the president said that he wants to see 50% of all new car sales be EVs or electric vehicles by 2030, right? If if we if we're going to achieve that kind of a goal, it means we need, to, we, the industry, all of, you know, the collective movement needs to ensure that charging infrastructure will serve a, a much greater diversity of customers than, than, than we say. 
And so just to, as, a, as a mental exercise, I, I thought through, imagine, imagine there's a family that has access to, to charging at home. They live in a single family home, for example, and it's easy for them to install a, a level two EVSE or even level one in their garage. And so they're willing to take, take the risk, purchase an EV, and that might, make, that might um, meet all of their needs for charging. And so they never have to charge at work or around town or on the, on the highway and using public charging. Imagine there's someone else who can charge at home and work and, that's, and that covers most of, the, of her needs, but she takes trips, long trips once in a while. So she needs to charge and public chargers on or near highways. That's uh, representative of the, of the charging pyramid we saw a minute ago. But now imagine someone who can't charge at home because they live in a, maybe a large apartment complex where the apartment manager just doesn't want to talk, just doesn't want to be bothered by, by, by charging infrastructure. But that, that individual or that couple might have access to charging at work and that might become the mainstay of, to meet their charging needs. And then they occasionally long trips, they're, they're able to charge on the highway. And then finally, there might be someone who can't charge at home and, and doesn't have the opportunity to charge at work um, but, but if there's sufficient charging in the community that, um, to meet his regular needs and or on the highway, that person might be still willing to buy an EV. Um, or maybe we should say that person, we, we hope that person will be willing to buy an EV if, if we're trying to achieve these high, high penetration targets. So what does this all mean for how we think about charging? I, I propose that we change our thinking um, to really just think, really frame the, the problem in, in two dimensions. Um, e charging can, can be located at destinations or it can be, lo it can be located, one can charge and route to their destination. Um, destination charging is ideal because the car is going to be parked there anyway, right? You go someplace, you, you park the car, you leave. If the car is plugged in while while it's sitting there, it's no it's 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 no bother, right? It's no skin off my back. I like to say, because the car is going to be parked there anyway. Um, that that's why home and work charging is is so useful and so appealing because the cars are dwelling there for a long time, right? But there but I submit there are also places that we that we vehicle drivers park around town in the city on a regular basis with you know. Um, for a fair, fairly long amount of time, that could also serve as excellent destination charging locations. For example, there's a, the, the supermarket in my town. I probably go to once a week, if not if not twice a week. If I could, if I couldn't charge at home, but I could charge there, um, that might meet all of my needs. Um, compare it, and but I'm only there for 20, 30, 40 minutes at a time. So level two charging might not be the right solution. I might need fast charging there, um, but, but yet I'm still at the destination. So I don't mind if it, if, if it takes 40 minutes. Compare that to the scenario when we're on a long trip, we, we, need, to pull, we need to find um, an exit uh, off the highway and charge as quickly as we can to get back on the road as soon as we can. That, um, that end route charging on the way to the destination um, typically, in that case, we typically want to charge as quickly as possible to get back on the road. So th and that's where we need this very fast or extreme fast charging as Matt has described. But the reason this all matters is because faster charging is more expensive charging. Um, so let, let's think about charging infrastructure and play, placing charging infrastructure at locations where we already plan to be parked and choose the equipment that, that allows us to charge I just got a notice saying my internet is unstable. Can you still hear me, hear me, Alicia? Now we can again, John. Oh no, how much did you miss? Uh, not much, we're good. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Let's not forget that many people can't afford to own a car in the US and many people don't want to afford a car. It's not, not common in, in our area, but in larger cities and metro areas, many people um, don't feel cars are practical. So let's not forget 
that when we're when we're talking about national goals for for decarbonization and um, that electrifying mobility services is important also as as a nation we are um, we are breaking records for 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 package delivery right we with the uh, popularization of online retailing and thanks to covid where we where when we were stuck at home there there are more packages being delivered and, and more truck transportation than ever and so electrification of, of delivery services is also really important this has this has pretty sweeping of impacts on um, with respect to environmental justice um, it, and the other, another comment is if we're thinking about climate change and, and greenhouse gas emissions reductions, what we really care about is electric miles driven, not just the number of electric vehicles sold. The, the adoption is means to an end. And so um, reminder that we should also be talking about, about transit and mobility services like Uber and Lyft and, and van pools and so on, and also uh, delivery. And then finally, con congestion reduction, it, was was a major um, a major goal before COVID when we all stopped driving and you know if there was congestion in, in cities before there will be again at some point simply selling electric vehicles does nothing to cur curb systemic congestion problems whereas mobility services does next slide so now I want to talk about charging infrastructure for fleets. We, we completed a project a, a few years ago now where we looked at a, a mobility service that was operating in the city of Seattle. And the vehicles in this fleet were essentially geofenced to only operate within Seattle proper, which is still a fairly large area, but a, a constrained or bounded geographic area nonetheless. This, um, this electric vehicle fleet had about 70 EVs in it with 100 mile range um, BMW i3s as shown here. And that fleet already had six uh, fast chargers in the Seattle area that they were using that were pretty much centrally located downtown. And so they wanted to inc increase their charging network by you know, installing their own, uh, owned it. they wanted to own and operate their own chargers and st install up to 20 more. And they had planned on just, just, just putting in 20, but um, we, stepped in and, and, and asked them to allow us to analyze, to, to do some analysis and modeling to understand how much benefit every charging, every new charging station would add above and beyond the six that they already used rather than going to the full, you know, immediately just going to 20, thinking more is better. And so we, we refer to that as, as analyzing the marginal benefit of every new charger. Um, and so the goal there was not, was not to say how many chargers can we, could we possibly ever use, but rather what 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 is the what what's the fewest number of chargers that we we can get by with, um, and how do we avoid uh, approaching the point of diminished returns? Yeah. Ultimately, the best way to do this would be, would have been through um, with cut with with me, by measuring financial cost, but that that became onerous for us. So instead, we the data just wasn't available. So instead, we used downtime as a surrogate for cost. So these. So, um, with the idea that any any time the vehicles were not available for providing rides to people because they had to be charging, um, that that was bad, and so we wanted to avoid or minimize downtime. Next slide. The good news was by by adding up to twenty charging stations, we were able to reduce the travel time that these vehicles uh, experienced to get to the chargers by fifty percent, but all told, the marginal benefit was actually very small um, with respect to reducing downtime because the time the vehicle spent at the charging station itself was the dominant component of the vehicle downtime. So in other words, there were a lot of chargers. It didn't take long to get there, but, but the 50 kilowatt um, charge power still required the vehicle to sit at the charging station for 30 to 45 minutes. Um, you, you can see from, this, from the slope of the red line with the, the data points in it that, that there's not a drastic change to the, to the shape or the slope. So there was no clear number of charges. Um, sorry, let me, let me start over. If you, look at, if you look at the plot in the red line, 
on the, the left side it represents the amount of downtime that fleet experienced when there was when we when they only used the original six charging stations. The next data point to the right represents a, a new charging station being being installed in a quote unquote ideal location, and um, shows you that a little bit of a little bit of downtime, or the fleet experienced slightly less downtime. And then we installed the eighth and the ninth and so on. We hope to see that after some number of new chargers, there would be this sharp sharp change or, or, or knee in the curve, we say, where every additional charger didn't really make much benefit. Incidentally, no additional charger made much benefit beyond the original six. So what we decided was for this particular fleet where the key was avoiding downtime for charging, it would be better to stick with the six chargers, but increase the power put more money into upgrading the, the charging equipment itself to make it an extreme fast charger, Matt described, um, and of course, updating the vehicles to accommodate that charging rather than putting charger 50 kilowatt chargers all over the place. Um, that, was, that met the need of that particular fleet. Now for, for other fleets, it might be acceptable to have some amount of downtime, right? Think of a, of a corporate or a city fleet where, where employees might drive the vehicle in the morning and in the evening, um, to and from work or, or to or to and from meetings, but if but there may be a time at night or in the middle of the day where it's okay for the vehicles to to sit and charge, and so if that's the case, then the opposite is, is true. Rather than spending money on very fast charging equipment, we go back to the the destination versus en route charging pyramid. It's better to charge more slowly at the at the places where the vehicles are sitting anyway because that's cheaper. Um, this same approach can be applied to other fleets, and um, we are actively looking for fleet partners who um, can, can share with us their use case, um, share data about how they use their vehicles so we can apply these same kinds of analytical techniques to help you understand um, you know, the, the right velocity for, for charging. Next slide. All right, in my last few minutes, um, I, I want to talk about load management. So uh, now that we know a little bit more about, about the technology, um, you know, what F X extreme fast chargers are, or XFC stations, let, let's, let's look at a hypothetical um, scenario. Imagine we had six 350 kilowatt chargers at one location. Um, we came up with a, a theoretical demand uh, pattern or profile for the station with vehicles coming and going based on data we've collected or we, that was shared with us from EVgo, a major charging station provider. And we, we, we sort of fused that with, with data from gas stations, a, a gas station that's highly used, uh, as in very highly used to come up with a, let's, let's say a very, a very busy fast charging station of the future. Um, we, we imagine that, that the users of that station would be driving um, an SUV or a sport or electric sports car that charges at 300 kilowatts uh, and others would be mid-sized EVs with 150 kilowatt charge rate. And then there might be compact EVs like an Nissan Leaf with 50 kilowatt charge rate and, and the charge profiles are shown. And then on the right, you see um, the results of, based on our simulation of cars coming and going throughout the day and charging. When you aggregate the, the electricity demand of all those all that charging together, this is what the utility would see. The top right figure being the, the green line being if all the cars were were just the small compact EVs. The middle of all the cars throughout the day were the midsize, and the at the bottom if they were all the, the high power um, uh, Porsche Porsche Taycans or or Rivian uh, R R one R one S's, and we see that it. it the charging is pretty uh, pretty peaky, as we say. Now, um, demand charges can be very high. I'm sure you've talked about that before. And, and we, you know, picking uh, picking a random electricity tariff out of the <laughs> out of the, the catalog of, of thousands across the country, the demand charges for a station charging these 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 high power sports cars or SUVs could be twenty five thousand a month. Right, that's pretty significant. Next slide. Um, so, so let's let's look at how let's see how this looks from an engineering standpoint. This chart looks like spaghetti, but let's walk through it really quickly. Um, next, please. 
So this circle, I want you to train your eyes on the, on the area in the circle. So the, so the blue line that, that runs right down the middle of the circle from left to right represents the, the electricity that's being demanded from the grid. And you can see how it's plateaued. And the reason it's plateaued is because we've applied, a, we've applied an imaginary or hypothetical stationary battery to the system. The, the, the orange line that, that spikes above that, that horizontal um, blue line represents how much electricity is going to the vehicles, but that's not being pulled, all being pulled from the grid because the battery, which is, represents the gray jagged line below, is discharging to make up the difference. Next. It turns out though that after a while, the battery um, runs out of charge and and so any charging that's done by vehicles has to be provided 100% from the grid. And so now we see that that blue line matches the orange line and, it, and, and that the, the amount of power that's demanded from the grid goes up considerably. Um, the, by the way, the battery is 500 kilowatt hours, so very big, half a megawatt hour. And, and it's, it's controlled to never, to, to prevent the station from ever drawing more than 600 kilowatts from the, from the grid while it still has some charge. But once, it, once the battery is out of juice, the, the grid has to provide the, the le what's left. So it goes well above 600. Next, please. Imagine if we had that same battery, but we increased that the, the amount of power that is pulled from the grid to 800 kilowatts. Um, we, can sh we can see here that the, 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 it's a little bit tougher to discern, but the, the blue line, uh, it, that that kind of look is is still plateaued. The horizontal line roughly running across, left to right across the middle of the circle, but that plateau is a little bit higher. And it turns out that by by allowing the grid to provide a little bit more power and drawing less from the battery during the day, um, we're we're able to make it through the whole day, serve all of the vehicles that that come during the day without exhausting the the charge on the battery thereby avoiding um, drawing higher levels of power from the grid. Next, please. And I'm re I realize I'm running out of time. I just have, I think, one more slide after this. So um, in summary, uh, half a megawatt hour battery. Uh, one second, I need to move my picture in picture here. Um, would cost about a half a million dollars. That's not trivial, right? But we're, we're able to reduce um, from a 1.7 megawatt daily peak to 725 kilowatts in the bottom in the bottom plot here, and if you do the math, that translates to saving about fifteen thousand dollars a month by redu in, in reduced demand charges. So just using a simple payback calculation, it would only take 33 months. You're not not looking at um, that, irrespective of interest rates and and um, net present value and so on. It, you know, uh, 33 months to, to pay back, which is which seems pretty reasonable. Um, we've done a lot of research on how adding predictive control can improve this even further. If you know, pr predicting um, who, who's coming and when, and then to, the, the best option is to have real time communication between the vehicles and the infrastructure to um, to control even further. Next slide. <coughs> All right, so I've, I've talked to you about infrastructure placement some philosophically, um, talked to you about how, we, how we've done it more analytically, we've talked about uh, extreme fast charging and helping to defray the cost. Ultimately, what we wanna do is take all of our modeling and simulation capability and simulate the city of the future that has trans electrified transportation across all, all segments from trucks and buses to light duty passenger cars that are privately owned and in, and in fleets. Um, off, uh, high penetrations of workplace charging, travel centers that may, may that include fast charging as well as hydrogen fueling, residential charging, and so on. And so we're, we're very interested in partnering with, with fleets, with other stakeholders to gather the data we need to and, and properly capture different use cases so that we can simulate each one of these individual use cases ind independently and then together so that we can we can understand what what uh, what an electric utility the demand that electric utility would have to serve in the city of the future.
Thank you so much, John. That was very informative. Um, I like the kind of calculations there right at the end to understand how the battery storage could impact the, the, the demand chargers or the payback period. Um, I do think there might be a question in the chat. Let me check here. Oh, Wid was just mentioning that LVE's demand charge is only $7 per kilowatt. Okay. <laughs> So that takes our payback period to 66 months, which is oh not not as it's yeah it's all it's all linear so it's not as attractive but but uh, if we're talking about 10 or 15 year infrastructure lifetime then that that might make sense for some people. Mm -hmm. um, does anyone else have any comments or questions for John? Since no one's hopping in, I, I'll ask a question. What kind of fleets are you ideally hoping to attract for some of these simulations? Like delivery or lease? Yeah, sure, sure. We, we'd like to cast a broad net, but we definitely want to focus first on transit. Uh, I'm okay. missed, I missed the presentation to start today's meeting from START and, and also from Proterra. I'm sure you've, you've heard about it a lot already, but, but um, we electric transit is... Uh, or, or transit agencies around the country are adopting electric vehicles, ag electric buses aggressively. So we want to make sure we 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 have a good a good case study, or maybe multiple case studies there. Small, medium, and large cities, for example. Um, and from there, we want to move to delivery. Um, I've, I've pictured here the in the in the lower left the the, the Amazon or or um, you know IKEA sorting or fulfillment center of the future where we have you know, solar panels across the roof. We have electric vehicle, electric trucks arriving, dropping the trailers off the dock and then driving around the corner and plugging um, the, the, the delivery vans that, that are loaded to then um, take the packages the last mile would also be, could potentially also be charging there. And so the, so the electricity demand at that distribution warehouse, which used to be maybe 250 kilowatts to serve the, the lights and maybe some conveyor belts um, now it could could be as high as 25 megawatts in the future if there are if it's a bit if there are a lot of vehicles plugging in um, so that so that's a very compelling use case for us but you know beyond that I mean you know, I could think of any number of um, other cases from you know, the, the, the much more futuristic ones like the robot, the robo taxis, you know, automated driving taxi services of the future that are electric to the more mundane that we have today, such as a, a corporate fleet, a city fleet that has, you know, vehicles in the motor pool that, that come and go and they plug in when they need to. Um, so we're, we're hoping to, to cover a lot of ground because ultimately the utility has to, has to serve, the, serve all of the load. It doesn't care what kind of vehicles plug in it, it just needs to provide the electrons, right? All right, does anyone else have any questions? Okay, well, I actually in our agenda didn't provide us much of a, or a break at all here. We're moving, we're actually, John, you didn't miss Proterra, right? Um, Stina is up next, but. Oh, great, John, okay. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you so much for taking the time to, to, to present this to uh, our group. Uh, this is very fascinating to me and um, I hope it's helpful for for some of our stakeholders here. And I know there's several people that were interested in um, in this presentation. Well, actually really all of them that have other obligations. So um, we'll be sharing this in, on our website as a, the recorded version, and maybe there'll be more, more feedback after that. So um, yeah, thank you so much for taking the time to, to share this with us. My pleasure, I appreciate the invitation. <laughs> all right, great.